So the front end of, of all of my course sites look a little different for many of you. Y'all had me already. All my little fancy buttons are gone because they make us use this template now. So all the biology courses, the front end all looks the same to alleviate some confusion between classes for students with navigation and whatnot. Um, I didn't think there was a problem with it. I kind of like the way I had my course set up, but at any rate, the, the meat of the course, which is all in the module section over here is all the same anyway, the way I like to set it up. It's just the front end looks different. All right, even if you have me for lecture, you notice it looks different than like the a and one, or if you had me for a and two before. So they all look like this. So when you log in, also, before I get into it, if you don't have notifications turned on, so it goes to your email or to your phone, you should do that. Because when I post an announcement, um, to let everybody know, you know, an update or something, it'll go straight to your phone and you don't have to wait to log in to click on this announcement button. So to set your notifications, you click this account button at the top up here. Sorry about that. And then um, click on notifications and a whole window pops up. You can set all kinds of stuff. You should do that for each one of your, uh, well, I guess if you do it here, it's for all of your courses, but um, just make sure you, you set notifications, all right? So everything's gonna be in this, in this module section. Of course, all of our Zoom links every Thursday which I have populated already will be under the zoom button as you know, because you clicked on it this morning. <clears throat> um, so you can just click on modules. Um, there's some modules in here that you don't see yet. When I want to show you what's in them, we're going to have a final exam, a final practical and a final physiology test at the end of the semester. You don't see this yet because it's, I didn't publish it. So <clears throat> ultimately we're going to have a final, uh, all of our, and, and the modules are going to be up here. So when it comes time to take a test, right when you click modules, you don't have to scroll down this whole page. I like to put them at the top. So our, our practicals and our physiology test will be up here at the top when it comes time to take the test. All right. So in AMP2 lab, unlike AMP1, we only have three practicals, regular practicals and three regular physiology test and AMP one, I think there's four. So we have three and three um, and they're going to go here and I'm going to show you where your grade comes from in a second. So you don't see these yet. This module has nothing to do with our course per se, but we were uh, told to include this in all the courses. So students would have links to different uh, areas on the Delgado website for questions they may have. You know, so that's why that's in there. Most of y'all probably won't have to even use that because you know how to do your email and everything already. Um, this office hour section, you really don't need either. Um, I'm gonna hold office hours and I held a couple this week via Zoom, but it was, it, it was kind of hard because I have to send out the link to all nine classes. So we had 50 people from all different classes, um, you know, in the room and I'm answering questions and everybody's confused. They were asking me, is this for lab? Is this for lecture? What well, was for everything? So all the students were invited. So that was kind of confusing. So I think what I may do from now on is just during office hours, be on the computer and you can email me. And if it's something simple, we could fix via email or answer a question via email. Great. If it's something that you think you need to actually talk with me about, then just email me and say, Mr. Russell, can you set up a Zoom link? You know, I, I, I have a problem with whatever, whatever it is. And I'll say, sure, let me go set up a Zoom link. And we'll do it that way, I think. Because there was a lot of confusion on Monday and Tuesday when I held those, those Zoom meetings. Um, in the Start Here module, <clears throat> you can go here. That's where you can see my office hours. I might be updating them now that I have a little bit more time um, in my schedule. They had to take one of my classes and give it to another instructor that wasn't full-time and I had extra classes. Um, your important documents like the department syllabus, which uh, you can read over, but I usually, I just go by the addendum that I made and then our lab schedule, which I think I have up over here, which I'll show you in a minute. So you just click on that, which I won't do because I'm about to go backwards and you'll see all three documents in there. Um, this is just a link to the Delgado academic calendar for important dates 
you know, registration dates, last day to withdraw, all that stuff is in the calendar. And then these, this is just your minimum computer requirements to be able to do stuff virtually. Like what, what kind of computer should you have? What should it be able to do? Um, and then grade information, you don't have to worry about that. It's just talks about the Canvas grade book and how to set notifications, which I just told you, just go to account. Uh, so I don't think you have to waste your time doing that. Besides, I have our Canvas grade book set up to calculate your grade anyway. So um, let's see. And most of you should have respondents on your computer already. There may be a couple that don't. So I had some emails, people asking me to send them the link to download respondents. The link is in here. So if you, if you click this button, you actually have a couple of little instructional tutorials right here for how to load on Windows, how to load on a MacBook or, you know, a Mac computer. And then the link to download Respondus Lockdown Browser on your computer is this one. So you just click that link and then follow the online instructions. So we have to have Respondus on our computer because we're going to take all of our tests using that Respondus Lockdown Browser. And if you haven't done so, which is only a couple of people that haven't done it yet. So if you're in a room and you have not done these, I need you to do them today. Don't wait for, for any assignment in this class. Do not wait until the due date to do them. These due dates aren't when it's really due. I push it off. That's just so students, for some reason that didn't do it, I don't have to go in there and reopen them. These assignments are due now. So, Ultimately, these are the census assignments. Oh, God. Okay. Jesus Christ, what did you do? Join without a video. Let's see. I don't know. So Jesus. Thank uh, you, my love. Come on. I don't know how to mute from here. All right. If you come in the room, just mute your microphone until you need to talk to me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know oh, I was that, a mute. Oh, that, <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that's okay. No problem. Um, all right, so I need these done now. If these are not done, that means the student is not coming to class or participating. And I have on the August 31st is the census day. And I have to drop students for non-participation on that day. Because after that day, I can't drop anybody. So if somebody doesn't do it and I don't drop them and they never come back and they never answer emails once that happens, they're going to get an F at the end of the semester. So if, if you're in the class and you're participating for the next two weeks, but all of a sudden the third, fourth, fifth week, you can't come back for whatever reason, you have to go drop yourself. Your teachers cannot drop you after August 31st. So that's important. I need, so, you know, just do these assignments. The verification assignment is just to see if Respondus is working on your computer. So it says it's worth one point. It's not worth any points. I have it in a section of the grade book that counts for nothing because there are some people that won't be able to do this because they can't get respondents to work and I don't want to dock them one point. So this is just going to let me know that respondents works on your computer. All right. So that's the welcome module. Now, the next thing you have to do, if you have not done it as of yet, you have to click on this engage website link. Just like, if, uh, just like AMP one had engage, if you took it at Delgado, we have engage for the lab. Also, the online learning homework management system for lab is called engage. Some students are confusing this with the Wiley plus that we use for lecture. They're two separate things. Although Wiley, the publisher Wiley owns both of them. We use engage for the lab and we use Wiley plus for the lecture. So you need to click on in the engage link. You have to tell it to open it up in a new window. And then you, you see the front end of your engage website. All of your assignments, all of, I'm sorry, all of your learning exercises are over here. These are the chapters in the lab manual. Everybody has access to the first two exercises for free. So even if you took this class, say last semester and you have to retake it, you still have to buy a new code because the code is only good for one semester. It's not like the lecture. So if you didn't buy it yet, that's fine. You can still click on the exercise one and, and work in there and do your, do your quiz. You can still work next week, but the third week, 
three our third week from now you won't be able to access this unless you buy the code so where do you buy the code well if you go to the bookstore and buy the hardback copy of the book it's going to come with the code if you buy a new one but if you have not gone to the bookstore to buy that book from the bookstore yet i would suggest not to do it because it's cheaper to click this button where it says to purchase it click here boom now i'm not going to do it because it's going to take me out of this but when you click on this button it's going to take you to a cart where you can select to buy the code and everything's going to be good all right now some people when they go to check out their cart is empty and it zeros out i don't know why it's doing it i keep telling people to change their browser on all kinds of things well yesterday in the amp one lab one girl said what she did is when it zeroed it out she clicked on review your cart button there's some kind of view the cart button and it brings you to the cart and it repopulates it in there for some reason i don't know why it does that and then you hit the checkout button again so you could try that if you're having problems but you need to you need to get the code before the end of next week so you could do this work in exercise three so let me show you what what the chapters look like. So you click on exercise one or any of them, and they're all set up exactly the same in the same order. So at the very top, you're going to have a printable PDF of the chapter. So you can always just read your chapter online, but if you like a paper copy to read, like I do, all you gotta do, well, you click on it and it opens it in this window and you can sit there and read through your chapter. You can also, when you open it, right click it and say print if you have a printer at home and you can print your chapter out. So it's a, I think it's about half price from the bookstore buying the book to just buying the code. And if you just buy the code, you still have access to the book because basically this website is the online version of our book just with extra learning resources. So if you wanna get back to the front end where all your links are and your quiz is, all you gotta do is re-hit this button over here to the left. So you click that button, it brings you back to the front end. So your, your chapter's at the top. The, there are practice activity links in the middle. Some of them have a few and some of them have a whole bunch. You're, it's not mandatory that you do these things. This is all just for practice work. However, you pay for it, so you might as well click on them and see what it's all about. Some of them are actually pretty good. Um, a, a couple of them I don't think are too useful, but not necessarily in this chapter, but other chapters. But you can click on them and, and you know just review some of that stuff. It'll help you. But the two most important areas of the Engage site is obviously the chapter at the top, this link where it says printable, and then the graded quiz. So you're going to have a graded quiz in Engage for each exercise lab that we cover. So over the summer, a student said, I didn't know I had to go into Engage and, and do a quiz. They didn't do any of them. And it was too late by then. Well, you know, I never go without telling people they have a quiz in here. And I even open it up as we go through the semester and say, okay, did you make sure you, you're doing these quizzes. So where are the quizzes located? Well, they're always located under where it says graded quiz. Now it's pretty obvious on this page because it's on, it's right on the front of the page. You don't have to scroll down, right? But look, look at exercise three. There's a lot more links in the middle. So, but it's still set up the same, your chapter, your practice activity links, and then your graded quiz. So sometimes you're going to have to scroll down to get to where the graded quiz is. Now, this is the most important because it's part of your grade. And obviously, the chapter in the book that you need to read. So those are the important links. All the other ones are Lanyap, you pay for them, and it's, you know, just review work. That's all it is. All right. So we're going to be working out of exercise one today. This week, you need to make sure you're doing your quiz in here. All right. So does anybody have any questions about the Engage site before I go back to the Canvas? Um, my question is, how many times are we able to do the graded quiz? Um, All right, the graded quizzes are not timed, and you have three attempts to do them. And 
uh, it's open book. All of our homework assignments are open book, which I'm about to talk about. So this is all open book work. All of your quizzes and the assignments in, in the learning modules in Canvas are all open book. Um, the only assignments that are not open book, obviously, are the practicals, the physiology test, and then the final tests. So all other work is open book, all right? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so let me go back to Canvas, go into modules. <clears throat> so you need to click on that engage link and start doing that now if you haven't done that, all right? Um, then you get to our learning module. They're pretty much set up all the same as well. Now you notice up here, I went, what I did is I, I built out the online lab first and then I course copied. Well, I uploaded a video from the summer on, I'm posting videos for them because they, they don't have mandatory meetings um, like we do. So you can view this if you want, but I'm going to be posting hours anyway. So we're going to have the one from today is going to be up and I'll probably put it, you know, down here. I might put it up here. It doesn't matter. But this is just the same stuff I did in the summer for this chapter. All right. A little video. Now, your assignments in your modules always will include one or two pre-lab quiz assignments, and at least two, a couple of them have three, but at least two uh, post-lab assignments. One's on anatomy and one's on the physiology. And so these are your homework assignments along with the engage quiz. So you're gonna have an engage quiz, you're gonna have a pre-lab quiz, you're gonna have a post-lab assignments as well down here. Now, all of those quiz assignments, or, you know, just called a quiz, all of those assignments count as 20% of your grade. So let me show you where your grade comes from. You guys can't see this section. This is only for me, but I wanted to show you because if you look over here, everything that I put into this module, this, this is basically the grade book. Everything that I put in this module, which I call quizzes, which are the, the quizzes from Engage. I have to make, make a placeholder for them because the grade's not ported over directly. So I have to put it in manually. So this is gonna be the Engage quiz one. Then you have exercise one, pre-lab, post-lab work, right? So I have that for all of the labs. So all of our assignments for all of the labs this semester, homework assignments go into this, this portion of the grade book, which counts as 20% of your grade, and it's all open book work. So right away you get 20% uh, of your work is practice work that's open book, all right? Um, Next. Uh, were due dates correct on those? Because I know you said for the other stuff that wasn't like the Okay, right so date. the due date right here you mean? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you see why, you see it says October? Yeah. No, this quiz is supposed to be done before Friday. The reason why I, I don't even know if I, I, I set this. It might've just poured it over that way, but I don't, I wait until we start getting into all the work because I have to port these in by hand. So these grades will not be in the grade book for a, another month or two, somewhere around midterm or thereafter, I'll start putting these grades in um, to this, this area. But you do have to adhere to the due dates for all of these assignments. You also have due dates for the engaged quizzes. So for instance, um, I forget exactly when I made that engaged quiz due, but technically you're supposed to have all of your exercise one assignments done this week, because guess what we're doing next week? Exercise two assignments. All of exercise two assignments are supposed to be done next week because the third week we're doing exercise three assignments. You follow me? So that's what I'm saying. Do not wait for the due date. The due dates are only there because I have to put a due date and I always push them way off. So I'm going to show you the calendar in a minute. And basically you're going to have to be keeping up with this work every day. And technically I'm glad you said that whoever that was, I, I can't see the names anymore, but um, the pre-lab assignments technically are supposed to be done before we come to lab. That's why it says pre-lab assignment. The post-lab assignments should be done after lab that day. But since we're in a virtual learning environment, you know, you'll have a couple of days to do it. So 
we're say a Thursday class, we, you know, your pre-lab work should be done before Thursday. Your post-lab work should be done no later than Saturday or Sunday. Because on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is when you should be reviewing for exercise two stuff, doing the pre-lab for exercise two. You can, and you don't have to wait on me to do these. It, it, just, it just says post-lab. You could do them now. These, the pre-lab assignments, you have unlimited attempts. The post-lab assignments, you have three attempts. And they're all open book. So you can go in and do an attempt and up. Oh, I didn't do too well. I better wait for class, you know, something like that. And then you still have two more attempts to do them. Besides the fact I have it set up to where you can review the right answers. So there's no reason why people don't get full credit on these things. And I'm thinking the only reason why some people don't get full credit on these things is because they are rushed. They waited to the last minute. They don't, they don't even have enough time to do all three attempts, something like that. So that's why I'm saying you, you need to keep up with all of these things. And all of these assignments are in your modules. All right. All right. So all the quit, all the homework assignments, which there's always engage quiz, a pre-lab and post-lab work are 20%. 55% of your grade, which is a majority of your grade comes from the practicals and the physiology test that we have to take. So this is a section of the grade book where all those major tests are going to go. And then the other 25% of your grade is going to come from the final tests at the end of the semester. So this is how Canvas is, is going to calculate your grade. And just to let you know, it only calculates your grade as you complete assignments. It does not calculate your grade on assignments you have not completed yet because there's no grade. So I did get a question about that in the email not necessarily from our class, but from somebody else. So the, the Canvas grade book is set up to, to do the calculation for you. You don't have to worry about it, all right? All right, so let's go back to the module section. And let me show you our learning resources. So our pre-lab work's gonna be up here. Then down here are all of your learning resources. Well, along with the videos you might wanna review. Um, and then your post-lab work is always at the bottom. So these modules are set up to where you can go through these modules and learn what you need to learn and be prepared to take the practical because your practical examinations are going to be on the computer. I mean, if you, if you took a summer class and you were in at least last spring, you, you know, we, we, you have, have to do everything on here. So where do the pictures come from? Well, it comes from any number of these resources or in the pre and or post lab assignments. So Mr. If Russell? You, yes. Um, whenever you get a chance, can you explain how the practical is going to go um, since we're virtual? Yeah, the practical is, it's going to go just like if we were in a lab. You're going to have stations of questions. They're going to, some questions are just going to be text questions. Some questions are going to be pictures, pictures of models, pictures of the histology slides, uh, pictures of the section. And they're going to be- Are you going to show one by one kind of thing? Well, yeah. It, no, when the, the way I do, I have the practical all open at once so you can scroll down through it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because some people were getting booted off because of their internet connection and stuff. So I, want, I didn't want them to have to keep loading questions. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, the test is going to pop up all at one time. Okay. So, and, and you just go down through them. Now, it's all right in. You have to, you have to type your answer in. Okay. So, it'll, it, let's say it's a picture of, I don't know, the heart. And there's, on that particular question, it wants to know three things. Lay, uh, identify the structure label number 23, 24, and 25, something like that, right? Right. And so you then have to type in, oh, 23 is the brachiocephalic artery. Boom. Uh, okay. 25 is, you know, the uh, interventricular septum, whatever, whatever they are. Just like it was in AMP1 lab, just on Correct. the computer. It's okay. On the, yep. On the computer. So, okay. and so what I'm saying with that then is how do you know how to learn everything? Well, there are all of your learning resources in here. All right. Um, I'm going to include in every one of the chapters, the chapter of my models book. Um, the endocrine chapter doesn't have too many models, but I do have a couple I'm going to show you, but the other chapters like the heart, 
Um, and you'll always know what the, the, my chapter is because I put models book. So this is a chapter out of the book that I wrote a long time ago. We don't use anymore, but I still like to, to use it. The only thing is with this chapter, which we're gonna, I'm going to really talk about next week, this, this chapter has all three chapters in one chapter. When I wrote the book, the blood chapters in there, the heart and blood vessels. So you're going to have to click on this to, to look at the heart. That same link is going to have the blood vessels in it. And that same link will have the blood chapter in it. Oh, look, I put it down here. Is that it? No, I don't think that's my chapter. Um, oh, but I did put it here, but it's the same chapter. All right. For that. So I'm going to have, so in this chapter, as we'll see next week, you're going to see models of the heart and stuff. So ultimately you're going to be learning out of the engage lab manual and all of these learning resources. That's the bottom line, all right? So somewhere in one of those resources, you're gonna find the pictures that are gonna be on the practical. So uh, as long as you're going doing all this work, reviewing all these documents and doing all this work and, not, and, and using time management and not rushing through it, and that way you can review it over and over and over again, there's no reason why you can't make an A in this class. All right, now if you have five other classes and your time is very limited and you have to rush through this stuff, you might be mediocre because some, most people can't just look at something one time and learn it. You're gonna have to spend time doing it. Um, I also, for the, for the labs that are heavy in models, I made all these Quizlets. The Quizlets have um, the pictures from my models book in it and they're labeled on the Quizlet as well. So in fact, what I did over the summer, which worked out kind of good, um, I pulled the Quizlet up and then I made everybody play the Quizlet live game while we're in a Zoom. It was kind of fun. Just, just to let people know, hey, you know, it, it flashes up things for you to identify. And if you can't identify it, you know what you have to go and study, you know? So that's pretty good. Um, so yeah, everything is in this module. If you ever have a question or you, or you don't know what something is because some pictures are not labeled. They do that on purpose to see if you could figure it out. You know, what is this? What's it look like? You know, um, and you could also use your textbook. For instance, this endocrine exercise that we're doing today is chapter 18 in your textbook. And there's, there's pictures of the, of the glands in there. There are some pictures of the glands in my book that I'm about to talk about. I'm going to lecture from my chapter today because I, I like this this chapter, I wrote it, I'm used to teaching from it. But you still need to make sure that you read through the chapter in the Engage Lab Manual as well. So it's gonna be reading intensive. I'm not saying it's, it's gonna be easy. It's gonna take a lot of time. So the more time you have to spend on it, the better. And, and what allows you to have more time? Time management. So you need to get in the mindset of thinking, I don't have a day off from A&P. You need to be doing this every day. You can't say, okay, I'm going to do A&P today. Um, and then I'll, I'm, I'm going to do A&P on Sunday. You can't do that. You need to look at this stuff every single day for at least some amount of time. All right. All right. So does, is everybody kind of understand how the class is going to run and where everything's located? Yes. Uh, but I have a question. Okay. So some of those image gallery, like for the first one, for the endocrine glands, Here. they are not labeled. Correct. And you said it's because you try to uh, make students to figure out, but it's sometimes we don't figure out about those things and then we can never find out because for instance, not the models, but the, the histology, sometimes it's hard to, um, figure out which one is which. It's easy for the, um, 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 I forgot, the thyroid gland, but some of them are really hard to see, oh, this is uh, the, hypo uh, the hypothesis, or this is, you know. Yeah, um, so uh, that's, partly, um, that's partly what we go through. Like, I'm, you're gonna know what gland this is. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna yeah, go through it. Yeah, this one is easy. The, the models oh. are not hard. The problem okay. is the histology. 
Yeah. So when you get to there the you when you, when, when, yeah. So when you get to the histology section in here, all of these slides. These are thyroids. They all look. They all look a little different, right? A little so different. You, that's what I'm saying. And, and and look, if you can't find it, all you have to do is just take a screenshot of it, and then send it to me, and I'll say, okay, yeah, that's the thyroid gland. That's okay. the adrenal cortex, you know, okay. that's the pancreas, that's a thyroid. This uh -huh. is the posterior pituitary, anterior mm -hmm. pituitary. Uh -huh. I can do it for you. Okay. But he here's the thing. Before you just fall back and say, I can't do it. I would try, I promise. You, what you do <laughs> is you, you can open your, your textbook and just thumb through it and see if you see anything that looks like it. Or... Right. What, what you could do is you can Google, because you're going to know there's only a few glands that we're technically covering. You, you're going to see it's like a handful, mm -hmm. five or six. Yeah. And if let's say you didn't know what this was, and you did a Google, you, and you said uh, thyroid gland, and you, you hit images. Oh, it I don't look anything like that. that. Then you can go adrenal gland. Nope, it don't look like that. You see what I'm saying? You can Google it. Like if I Googled the pituitary gland right now, mm -hmm. a billion pictures would come up. Some of them would look like this. Some of them are going to be stained a little different, but for, let's just try one. While well, for this one, I had to guess because uh, that was the one I, I could not figure out. I thought it was the um, uh, testes, actually. And then I went to check the test and it was not the testes. Then I went to pituitary gland and it was not, I didn't find any pictures right. like that. And uh, over there, uh, I can see one of them here. Um, all right, see? I just yes. typed in pituitary gland yes. slide. Look at all these things. Right. All right. And it so, was hard. I had to guess, and I guessed right. And you guessed right, correct? <laughs> yes, but uh, I mean. Right. So yes. if, and I'm not saying, I'm here to help you. If, if you think, oh, I don't even know what to search. That, that's fine. Just email it to me. I'll, I'll tell you what it is for sure. All right. I promise I will yeah. try until I cannot figure out at all. And then I will, I will email you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Look, if y'all are ever confused, just take a screenshot of what it is, email it to me, and then I'll email you back with the answer. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a question. Okay. So I, I remember you were saying that you have Quizlet. Right. Chapters. How yeah. do we go about getting it? Because for this chapter, we, we don't have we don't have one for this chapter. Gotcha. Because okay. this this chapter is mainly physiology. Although you're going to have to be able to identify this stuff on the practical, like the mm -hmm. slides, and I'm going to show you a couple of the models with it on there in a second. But um, the, all of the other labs that are model intensive, they're here. Gotcha. Okay, I see. Now also. Let me, let me scroll all the way to the bottom. Yeah, here it is. Look, at the very bottom, I, I put the link to my, to my Quizlet account. So if you clicked on that, well, let me see what it looks like if we go to it. Open it, new one. Can you all still see my screen? Yes. All right. Now, I don't know. I guess students that are in, that are like in my Quizlet, I'm assuming they're able to post stuff because this says developmental psychology exam it three. The and it's same way to me. It showed the same way to me. This, this page, like, like it is now, that's how it shows. Yeah. So some of this stuff is not from me is what I'm saying. I think other students or something posted some of this stuff, but if you click on folders over here, all the folders will pop up. I put everything in folders. So you click on that folders and it, let's say you wanted to do the heart models because we're doing that next week. Just click on that and it'll open up the slides that I put in for the heart model. You see what I'm saying? Also, um, the way Quizlet redid their interface, it kind of squishes it up. So what you can do, instead of increasing the size here, you can click on, well, I can't see it because of this. Up here to the upper right, I don't know if y'all can see, because I got a little box in my way. There's, oh no, it's right here. Up here at the upper right, you click these little three dots, and then 
you can zoom in to say increase and it, it increases the size of the page, right? And then you can hover over it and see what, what they are. If you have a problem with that, I, the, ever since Quizlet kind of changed their interface, it kind of messes it up, but we're going to, we're going to look at this next week. I'm going to try and play the Quizlet game, but yeah, that's how you get to it. All right. So the other chapters will have the links to the Quizlets, or you can go to the very bottom and click on the, the whole class link. All right. All right, does anybody else have any questions before I pull this up and start going through the material? All right, very good. Um, and I'm assuming everybody can still hear me. I'm sorry, um, it, uh, I'm trying to go to folders to go to your class on Quizlet and it doesn't go, it just show my folder which is empty, I don't have any folder. Then I clicked on your class and Whatever, I try to figure out for each uh, chapter, I guess. Wait, I you mean, went? I went to Quizlet. Um, oh, and then you, you, I, don't, you don't see this folders button over here? I see the folders button, but doesn't go to your class. It's for some reason. Let's see. Does it look like this? It doesn't. It does not? That's what you it, said? It does not. It shows my empty folder, actually. <laughs> Um, then I'm going again. All right. Well, let me try it again. No, for you, it works because it's your, it's, it's your, um, Quizlet. Did you, but did you, you may have to log out of yours and then try to log into oh, his. Wait, so you have your own Quizlet account? Is that what you're saying? I do. And then I went to your class, Biology 254, Professor Thomas Ross. No, you should log out of your account and go into um, Canvas like he's doing, and that way you'll access his Quizlet. That's what I'm doing. I'm accessing his from the, from the, the modules, and I go directly to his class, and then it shows... Can you share your screen with us so we can see? All right, hold on. Let, let, let me do this because we're going to be running out of time. Yes, yes. Uh, Marcia, oh, after, yes, Marcia after, we're, after we're done with the mm -hmm. lecture, it's going to take me about an hour and 25 minutes to talk what I'm about to talk about. Our brains are going to be tired in a minute. I, I see. So I after, see. after we go through the material um, and I stop recording, uh, then I'll have you share your screen so I can see what, you're, what it looks like and see if we can fix it, okay? Well, for each chapter, it works fine. So if you uh, add each chapter of Quizlet um, um, instead of the whole thing, that works fine for me. Oh, well, good. No problem if, it, with that. If, if it works that way, you can just use it that way. But okay, I still, I will still want to see what's going on with this for you. So okay. we'll, we'll do that when we're done with um, the endocrine information, OK? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I, you should be doing the class. Look, the, sorry. The, the first week, everybody's trying to get straight. Trust me. It's, it, okay. it's, it's fine. It's no big, it's no big deal. Thank you All so right. Much. You're welcome. Okay. So Mr. If, Rosa, go, go ahead. I'm sorry for cutting it off. I noticed that one of the um, post lab um, quiz was timed. Is it supposed to be so? Um, I think the, post the last lab one, that of the physiology. I think the, the post labs are timed. Let me see. No, this one, the other one. Oh, that one's not timed. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the other instructors set, set these. Some of them okay. may be timed and some of them may not be timed then. No, I just wanted to be sure if actually yeah. we're, because this is my first time doing, doing assignment like this time with you. Yeah, we have, we have, it looks like 20 minutes, you have three yeah. attempts and you get to see the right answer. So okay. that's what I'm saying. It, there's no reason why people don't get full credit because you take it and then you can see what you got wrong and redo it. But your second attempt is not the same as the first one. It's always different. Well, that's because there's a little pool of questions. That's why. 
but it's not a whole lot. You know, by the time you're on your third attempt, um, you, you've seen all the questions. You should be able to have seen all the questions on the third attempt. It does generate it randomly though. Um, but I'll go in there. I'll, I'll have to go in there then. I, did, I was unaware of that. I don't know if the other ones are that way. I'm gonna look at it later so we can get into our lab for today and I'll take the time limit off so you can spend as much time as you want. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Let me make a note of that. All right, so if you all have any other questions about anything, just email it to me and, and I will answer it and fix it and all of that good stuff, all right? All right, so what we need to do now is start talking about glands and hormones and the cells that make those hormones. I guess I could just do it in here so I don't have to reshare. Might be better if I reshare. Let me see. Can you guys see the uh, the chapter up? Yes. Okay, good. Sometimes I notice it, it makes me reshare my screen. All right, so don't worry about these chapter numbers up here at the top. That was just a chapter number because of when it was in the book that I wrote. So don't worry about that. It, what's important is that it's the endocrine system, right? So let's just get into this and I'm gonna talk about some of the information that I want you to learn and then at least just show you where I need you to go read some information as well. Um, and if you ever have a problem with what you're going through, you need to let me know, all right? Some students don't ever let me know, but don't be shy. I'm pretty easy to, to talk to and, and I respond very quickly. So just always let me know if you have an issue, all right? All right, so first of all, um, if you remember from a p one, like on day one or somewhere around, even when we did the nervous system, we told you or your teacher told you that the two systems in the body that control everything is the nervous system and the endocrine system because chemicals basically regulate cell activity, cell physiology, what tissues do, what your organs are doing. Chemicals do that. So the nervous system does that by releasing neurotransmitters the endocrine system does that by re producing and releasing hormones. So just go through a little introduction in here about uh, hormones and how they're going to bring about their effects on a cell. And it basically deals with the receptors that cells have for the particular hormone. So you're going to hear me say the word target. Um, targets are cells, organs, or tissues that have receptors for a particular hormone. So if a cell doesn't have a receptor for a hormone, the hormone can never tell the cell to do anything. The receptors for the hormones are located in one of two main places. They're either found in the plasma membrane, the cell surface, or they're found inside the cell technically three places on the inside of the cell, but inside the cell. So if they're found in the membrane, they're called cell surface receptors. If the receptor for a hormone is found on the inside of a cell, it's called an intracellular receptor. And so I separated out the two main groups that hormones can be lumped into. And that is pretty simple. Hormones are either considered to be water soluble or lipid soluble. And all of the hormones that are considered to be water soluble are destined to bind to a cell surface receptor, right? So which types of hormones are water soluble? Well, all protein hormones are water soluble. And I listed out a few of them. We're gonna talk about uh, some of these hormones in a minute. Everybody recognizes insulin though. Um, Biogenic amines are water soluble. And some people say, well, what's a biogenic amine? Well, biogenic amines are chemically modified amino acids. So you might remember that term, amino acids. So some amino acids 
actually are building blocks, chemical building blocks to produce a hormone or neurotransmitter for that matter. But um, a couple of these should look familiar to you. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, we talked about in AMP1. And I'm sure many of you heard of melatonin before because some people take that as a sleep aid, right? Um, so epinephrine and norepinephrine is basically adrenaline and noradrenaline. These are made from tyrosine, an amino acid. So we call it a biogenic amine. All biogenic amines, no matter which ones they are, are water soluble. The acosinoids are the strangest of the groups that people never hear of. Um, but you know about them indirectly if you have allergies. Like if you take Zyrtec, you block some of these leukotrienes. If you have a headache and you take aspirin, you block the production of some prostaglandins. So eicosanoids are water soluble. What's, but what's kind of strange about that is they're actually made from a lipid. It's a modified fatty acid off of a phospholipid. So you might think, well, why is it water soluble if it's made from a lipid and lipids are fats? That's because the fatty acid is modified. I'm not gonna go through the chemistry and tell you why, but the eicosanoids are water soluble, even though they're made from fatty acids. So um, we're gonna, you're gonna learn more, a little bit more about prostaglandins and leukotrienes in lecture. I'm not gonna learn any more about them in, in the lab, but these bring about induced pain and inflammation. And you might think, well, that's bad. Well, pain allows you to know when something's wrong and inflammatory responses is the beginning of tissue repair. So pain and inflammation is not all bad. It's just extreme pain and extreme inflammation can, especially extreme inflammation can harm the body. So ultimately, if you have allergies, you go take some, uh, at least Zyrtec. Uh, Benadryl doesn't block any of these. Benadryl, which is uh, diphenhydramine, blocks uh, histamine, which is not an eicosanoid. Um, histamine is actually a modified amino acid. All right, so the lipid-soluble hormones. Which classes are all lipid soluble? Well, all steroid hormones are lipid soluble. Everybody knows testosterone and estrogen at least, but there's a whole bunch of other steroid hormones and we're gonna talk about them. So all steroid hormones are lipid soluble. The thyroid hormones, at least T3 and T4, which we're gonna mention in a minute, are lipid soluble. And then this strange molecule, nitric oxide, this is actually a gas that's made from an amino acid. It's not a biogenic amine, but it is made from an amino acid, but a gas is given off. It's NO, nitric oxide, one nitrogen, one oxygen. It's produced by nitric oxide synthase. And the reason why we cover that is because it's one of the most important vasodilators in the body. And you're gonna learn more about that as we go through the semester. So all of these are lipid soluble, which means they're destined to always bind to an intracellular receptor because they can get straight through the plasma membrane. So water-soluble hormones bind to cell surface receptors. Lipid-soluble hormones bind to intracellular receptors. But nonetheless, by binding to the receptor, the hormone changes what the cells do. It controls their physiology. So depending on the hormone, depending on the receptor and the cell type, the physiology is all different. The, the types of changes that can come about. But what can alter or increase or decrease the effectiveness of that physiological change? Well, several aspects of hormone action can either enhance, increase, or decrease the effectiveness of the hormone to, to induce physiological change. And so the first one is pretty simple. How concentrated is the hormone in the blood? Do you have a lot of it or do you have a little of it? If you have a lot of it, obviously with a higher concentration, your initial response is gonna be pretty strong. On the other hand, depending on the receptor number, but on the other hand, if the concentration of the hormone is low, then the physiological responses are low. The other aspect of that comes from the actual number of receptors. How many receptors the cells have mean something. And what is interesting about cell biology and cells themselves is they can control the number of receptors that they, they contain in their membrane. So cells can, 
can increase the number of receptors in the membrane. And if they do that, that's called upregulation when they increase the, the, the receptor count. If they decrease the number of receptors in their membrane, that's called downregulation. Now, if a cell is understimulated, let's say the hormone concentration is too low, one of the responses to many cells in the body is to start producing more receptors to try and make the cell more sensitive to that lower concentration of the hormone or any other chemical that you could be talking about. But if the, if the concentration of the chemical, in this case, the hormone, if it's, if it's too high and the cell is becoming overstimulated, cells don't like to become overstimulated. So what do they do? They start taking their receptors away from the surface. So they downregulate and it makes the cell less responsive to a hormone or a chemical. So this concept right here is, can also explain a little bit about how withdrawal symptoms happen in, in people that are abusing drugs. And I'll just go over it briefly. Um, a person that takes a drug and they get their high or whatever they're doing, you know, the ne then the next time they go to take it, they don't get the same feeling so they have to take more of the drug. The next time they do it, they have to take even more of the drug. You know why that happens? Because the cells are becoming overstimulated and they keep decreasing their receptor number. So they become less sensitive to that concentration of the drug, so they gotta take more of it. So then all of a sudden, the person stops taking the drug altogether and the cell has very little receptors at the surface and is totally understimulated by their neurotransmitter system and they go through withdrawals. So they stay in the withdrawal symptoms with certain drugs until the cells upregulate to the regular number of receptors again to make the cell normally responsive again. So by abusing chemicals, you make your cells in your body sensitized to it or less responsive to it because they downregulate their receptors. Now that's not the case for every single type of drug, but some of them, it works out that way. But in this case, the cells can increase or decrease your receptor count. It makes them more or less responsive to a hormone. Um, also, the availability of the receptors. It's not good enough just to have the receptor. What if you, you have the receptor up there, but another chemical is blocking it? Certain chemicals can actually bind to the receptors and block them. And if it's being blocked, it doesn't matter if it's there or not. The hormone can't bind to it. We, in fact, have medications that we purposefully block receptors to help treat certain ailments. So people with high blood pressure, hypertension, you might have heard of this before. They might be put on beta blockers. They might be put on calcium channel blockers. These are drugs that block these things to prevent a hormone from stimulating the cell. So people on beta blockers are preventing adrenaline, epinephrine and norepinephrine from activating and increasing cardiac activity. Because if you have high blood pressure, you don't want your cardiac activity high. You want it low. So I'll put an example of a beta blocker right here, propranolol. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but um, that's just one type of medication for high blood pressure. It blocks the ability of epinephrine and norepinephrine to bind to their beta receptors. So that's what blockers are. Now, what about multiple hormone interaction? So there's three scenarios where hormones can interact together to bring about physiological responses in some form or fashion. The first effect is called a permissive effect, or we have a permissive hormone. So what does that mean? Well, I gave you an example. Thyroid hormones are permissive hormones for epinephrine and norepinephrine. And so what I mean to say by that is this, epinephrine and norepinephrine have to bind to their beta receptors on the heart to increase cardiac activity. That's what they're trying to do when the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter or the adrenal medulla releases epinephrine into the blood. They're trying to well, do a lot in the body, but as far as the heart is concerned, try to increase cardiac activity. But 
their response is much greater if thyroid hormone is present as well. Because what the thyroid hormone is going to do, one of its roles, is it thyroid hormone tells the heart cells, hey, make some beta receptors because epinephrine and norepinephrine is about to come along. And they'll be able to bind to it. So basically, the permissive hormone enhances the physiological response on a cell or a target by another hormone. It's called a permissive effect. Now, the next two deal with two or more hormones that either bring about a, the same type of effect, which is called synergistic, or opposite effects, which is called antagonistic. So synergistic hormones work together to bring about a common goal or to achieve a similar physiological task in the body. So an SYN in Latin means the same. So synergistic hormones work together to bring about a common physiological event. So look at the example I gave you. Everybody's heard of testosterone before. You probably have not heard of follicle stimulating hormone as of yet, unless you already read the book or took the class before. But testosterone works together with follicle stimulating hormone. And together, these two hormones increase sperm production in the testicle of the male to a maximum amount. So sperm production, which is called spermatogenesis, requires follicle stimulating hormone. So if the testosterone concentration was low, but you still had follicle stimulating hormone, the male will still make some sperm, but it won't be a maximal account. It won't be a maximal amount as if testosterone was high. So together testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone maximizes sperm production. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and there are, there are other synergistic hormones. We'll talk about them as we go through. Antagonistic hormones do exactly the opposite thing. So I'll put an example uh, that I think everybody can relate to and that's blood sugar. Um, so everybody's heard of insulin. You may not have heard of glucagon, but insulin decreases our blood sugar in several ways and glucagon increases your blood sugar. So since they do exactly opposite things, they are considered to be antagonistic hormones. So these are basically just definitions, at least learn the example that I put for each one, although there's many more different types of examples. All right, so let's start with our first gland, the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, uh, science name or Latin name is called hypothesis. Um, there are two lobes to the gland, two primary lobes. Uh, anterior lobe and a posterior lobe. It's referred to as the anterior pituitary or the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is called the adenohypothesis and the posterior pituitary is called the neurohypothesis. I'm gonna tell you why in a second. So the pituitary gland itself hangs off the, the inferior portion of the hypothalamus. So here's the brain, obviously you remember from AMP1, the hypothalamus is the bottom part of the thalamus down here. And extending off of that is a little stalk of tissue that holds the pituitary to the brain. So this gland is actually inside your cranial cavity, hanging off of the brain. If we take a section of it and look at it under a microscope, it looks like this. So on a lower magnification, what you can see is two different areas. One's a lighter area and one's a darker area. This lighter area is always the posterior pituitary gland. The posterior pituitary gland is called the neurohypothesis because it's not a gland at all. It's nervous tissue. It's an outgrowth of the brain from the hypothalamus. And basically it's comprised of axons and axon terminals of neurons. And they have some supportive cells in here as well. But so basically it's nervous tissue. It's not even a gland but I'll talk about that in a second. So this is, that's why it's called the neurohypothesis. Neuro for nervous and hypothesis means pituitary. Now the darker region right here, and you can see it in the enlarged magnification, posterior over here, anterior over here. The anterior gland is always a little bit darker when we stain it because it's the true gland. 
It's a true gland. It's made of glandular epithelium, whole bunch of cuboidal cells all in here, all right? There's five different cell types in there. And so this part of the gland is also called the adenohypothesis because the prefix adeno means gland. And of course, hypothesis means pituitary. So yes, on the practical, they'll have a pointer right here. It'll say identify number one, boom, posterior pituitary gland, or number two, anterior pituitary gland. You're gonna have to identify this stuff off of the slides. So make sure you're reviewing all those learning resources and your pre and post lab assignments to prepare for that. And again, if you, if you find something you don't understand or it's not labeled, just email it to me and I'll answer it. All right, so there are five cell types in this anterior pituitary gland. You need to know the cell type name and the hormones they make, and you should know their abbreviations. So let's just go through them pretty simply. All of the cell types that are in the anterior pituitary gland end in the suffix troph. So that's how you're gonna know that you're talking about the cell type. It's gonna end in troph. So the first one up here, somatotrophs. Somatotrophs produce human growth hormone. And we'll talk more about these a little bit, or I'll show you the table of them at the end of the chapter. So somatotrophs produce HGH. Now, some books just put GH for growth hormone, but all mammals have their own version of growth hormone. So I always put HGH, which is human growth hormone. All right. So somatotrophs make human growth hormone. Thyrotrophs produce thyroid stimulating hormone. So look at this name real quick. Thyroid stimulating hormone. Who can guess as to what that hormone's role is in the body? To stimulate. To stimulate what? The thyroid hormones. Very good. The name defines exactly what it does. Sometimes it works out that way, by the way. In this case, thyroid stimulating hormone is responsible for stimulating the thyroid gland, a particular cell type, albeit, to produce their hormones. And I'll show you which ones they are in a minute. So thyrotrophs produce thyroid stimulating hormone. Corticotrophs produce two different hormones. The main one that we're interested in physiologically is a big long word. Students hate it when they first see it, but it's called adrenocorticotropic hormone. So look at this word. Adreno means adrenal gland. Cortico means cortex. So this hormone is going to have something to do with the adrenal cortex. And then tropic on the end, or I could change that to I-N instead of C, a tropin or a tropic hormone is a hormone that affects another gland. So I could say adrenocorticotropin. So if you put I in on the end of it, you don't have to say hormone after it. But in medical terminology, if you have IC, IC means pertaining to something. So you have to say what it's pertaining to, adrenocorticotropic hormone. All right, so that's just a play on the language there. So that hormone is going to be responsible for stimulating the adrenal cortex, the particular part of it, to make their hormones. Um, melanocyte stimulating hormone is not all that physiologically relevant now because it's in low concentration in a, in a healthy adult. But it does increase in concentration in pregnant females. That's why the female gets a discolor, a darker, uh, like on their belly, might turn darker, a little line on the belly and stuff like that. Or in... Uh, certain disease states like Addison's disease that you'll be learning in, uh, in lecture. Um, Addison's disease causes an increase in melanocyte stimulating hormone and the person's skin gets a little bit darker than normal um, relative to their genetics. So the one that we're really interested in is this one, but you need to know that it makes both. Um, um, is there a place where we can like see what they do? Because I just see yes. going here. I'm just going over the names right now. I have a table at the very end of the chapter that I'm going to show you uh, where uh, the functions are located. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Um, yeah, we're going to come back to this. I'm just going over their names right now. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll talk about, you'll see, when, as I get to the end, we're going to recover this because we have to talk about the hypothalamus as well. Because we have to talk about some hormones from the hypothalamus and how they affect the anterior pituitary gland to produce or not produce all of these. So yeah, I'm just showing you what they are right now. 
Um, the lactotrophs produce prolactin, and prolactin is responsible for targeting the mammary glands and, and at least in part, start to uh, cause lactation to occur. It's not the only hormone that does that, but prolactin helps increase milk production in the mammary glands so the baby can eat. Um, the gonadotrophs produce two hormones, which are called gonadotropins. They're called gonadotropins because those hormones affect the gonads. So they, the gonadotropins are follicle stimulating hormone, which I just mentioned at the very beginning, and this one, luteinizing hormone, all right? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them in a minute as well. Now, the posterior pituitary gland. So all this comes from the anterior pituitary gland, all right? The posterior pituitary gland does not, I'll repeat it, does not produce any hormone. The posterior pituitary gland does not produce any hormone, but it releases, it stores and releases two hormones, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. Antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that causes your kidneys to save water. And we'll learn more about that as well. So it, it's an antidiuretic. I'm sure you heard of diuretics, right? What do diuretics do? Um, it um, um, allows you to um, urinate. It allows you to what? I'm sorry, Marcia. I don't know if he urinates the right. <laughs> uh, if somebody uh, took a diuretic, what would they have to do? They go, have to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. Very good. Yeah. So diuretics make your kidneys dump water out. So that diuretics increase your urinary output volume. So and like does, some blood pressure medicine, they, it's like mixed with like a, I guess you would call like the beta blocker in an antidiuretic because it makes you go to the bathroom. Okay, very good. So let me get to that. Yeah, very good. Whoever said that, I couldn't see your name. So diuretics make your kidneys dump water from the blood out in urine. So your urinary output volume and your blood volume are, are, in, are related. If your urinary output volume is going up, that, that extra water has to come from somewhere. It comes from your blood. So people that take a diuretic they basically are urinating out the water and it decreases their blood volume. And when your blood volume drops, your blood pressure drops. So yes, diuretics are actually the first round of medical therapy for hypertension. So people that have mild hypertension, a diuretic might work. But if, if that diuretic can't control their hypertension, then they, the doctor puts them on a calcium channel blocker, then a beta blocker, they might be on all three. There's also ACE inhibitors, which we'll talk about later, uh, but which are uh, hypertensive meds as well. So the point of that conversation was this, diuretics make you go to the bathroom and lose your water. Antidiuretics, like an antidiuretic hormone, makes your kidney save your water and puts it back in your blood. So this is a water conservation hormone and helps maintain your blood pressure. Oxytocin, you learned about in AMP1. Who remembers what oxytocin did? Increases the labor. Yeah. Causes uh, your uterus. Uh, construction. Very good. So everybody always remembers that, right? So from the positive feedback uh, loop that you learned in AMP1 on day one, oxytocin causes labor contractions, makes the, 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 my, the muscle in the, in the uterus called the myometrium contracts in order to try and, and have the baby uh, give birth to the baby. Everybody knows that, but this is the hormone that, that does that. So these two hormones are released from the posterior pituitary gland. They're not made in here. So where are they made? They're made up here in the hypothalamus. So those hormones are made up here in special neurons called neuroendocrine cells. And then those hormones are transported to the posterior pituitary gland down the axons of those neurons where they're stored in here until they're released. So the anterior gland makes hormones and releases them. The posterior gland only stores two hormones and then releases them. All right, so the next gland is the thyroid gland. Now, um, I don't have the model on here to show you, but you're gonna see it um, in, you're gonna see it in uh, the work in, in, the, in the chapter. But the thyroid, 
the thyroid gland lies just inferior and lateral to your Adam's apple. So if you can find your Adam's apple in your, in your, in your throat, right? And then you, you go down a little bit into the side and you, you start palpitating, you're touching your thyroid gland. So the Adam's apple, as it, it's really called the thyroid cartilage, that's part of your voice box. So I think on the practical, they even have a model of that, which we do later anyway. And they got a little lobe of the thyroid on there. So if you see a little voice box model, little Adam's apple looking model, it's blue. And it has a, one of the lobes of the thyroid on it. It'll have a pointer on it and ask you to identify that. But you'll see it in your, in your assignments. Um, I don't have a picture of that in this chapter. I have it in the respiratory chapter. But nonetheless, if we took a section through the thyroid gland, it would look like this. So obviously on low power, you see tiny little circles everywhere in there. If you look hard, you can see them. But on the increased magnification, now you can see the circles everywhere. This should be one of the easiest glands to identify because as soon as you start seeing all of these circles, no matter what the coloration is, that it could be stained a totally different color. If you see these circles everywhere, you're looking at the thyroid gland. These little circles are called thyroid follicles. The cells that line the follicle directly around the perimeter are called thyroid follicular cells. The thyroid follicular cells produce triiodothyronine and tetra iodothyronine, T3 and T4. And T4, a common name for that, you might already know the name, is thyroxin. You've probably heard of that before. So uh, tri means three, as you know, tetra means four. Iodo means iodine. And theranine is the Latin term for thyroid hormone. So the, the only reason why you need iodine in your diet is so your thyroid gland can make these two hormones. No other cell type in your body needs iodine to do anything. So the only tissue in your body that uses iodine is your thyroid gland to make T3 and T4 hormones. Now, uh, on the outside of the follicle, which you can't see, and they may or may not make you identify them if they have an enlarged, a higher magnification of this, if they're pointing to a cell that is not part of this circle directly, but they're pointing on the outside of it, like right there or over here or out here or right here or here, where not only the cells that are directly outlining the circle are the thyroid follicular cells that make T3 and T4. The parafollicular cells are the cells that lie on the outside of the follicle. So those cells produce another hormone called calcitonin. And calcitonin decreases your blood calcium levels. That's its role. It decreases it. I'm going to teach you how, well, you're going to learn how in your lecture. And then if you have a problem with that, then just email me. For now, in here, all you have to know is calcitonin's role is to decrease blood calcium levels, all right? Now, the next two little paragraphs, I want you guys to read through this. I'm gonna talk about what's in this top paragraph at the very end of the packet when I show you the table. But down here, um, whoever asked about the functions, I put some functions for T3 and T4, all right? I want you to read through, through this. And if you don't understand what you see in there, just email me or you can ask me for a Zoom link. But I'll just go ahead and tell you, T3 and T4 are the hormones that are considered to be the thyroid hormones with air quotes there. Like for instance, if somebody says they have hypothyroidism or they have hyperthyroidism, they're talking about the level of their T3 and T4, not calcitonin. Because T3 and T4 manipulates metabolism of the nutrients in the body, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. It's involved in maintaining your body temperature. It increases our metabolic rate. Uh, it does a whole lot uh, in, in our body. So I don't want to sit here and just read through this paragraph. I want you to go through it. And if you don't understand it, then just let me know. 
all right? All right, so let's go through the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland, somebody's me. Okay. The parathyroid gland lies on the back of the thyroid, the thyroidic lobes. So if you were looking at the posterior aspect of the, the lobes of the thyroid gland in the neck, you would see four little rounded elevations of, of glandular tissue, which are the parathyroids. So notice right here, you see in this, in this slide, all of these little circles everywhere, obviously that's gonna be the thyroid. So everybody look at that for a second. The coloration here looks different than what we just looked at, but you see a whole bunch of circles everywhere, right? That's this, all these little circles. This one's just staying different, but you see all the little circles everywhere. So this is the thyroid gland. Now on the outside of the thyroid gland is the parathyroid. The parathyroid does not have all them little circles in it, as you can see. The parathyroid gland does contain two different cell types, but I'm not going to put the cell types on the physiology test. Um, but we do have to know that for lecture, so I guess I'll just tell you. There's the majority of the cells in here are called principal cells, and the principal cells are the main cells that make parathyroid hormone. So that's the hormone that the parathyroid gland makes. It's going to be hard to remember that one. That's a little joke. Parathyroid hormone, get it? All right, so the principal cells make parathyroid hormone. The other type of cell in here is called an oxyphil cell. And the oxyphil cells have the ability to make parathyroid hormone, but uh, they're still unsure of their exact role. So that's why I kind of don't go over them. But we do know that uh, within certain cancers, parathyroid cancers, that the oxyphil cells overproduce parathyroid hormone. All right, so what does parathyroid hormone do? Well, it regulates our blood calcium levels, and it does so by increasing calcium. So parathyroid hormone, in all of its effects, increases your blood calcium levels. So this hormone, PTH, parathyroid hormone, is antagonistic to calcitonin. Calcitonin's role in the body is to decrease calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone's role in the body is to increase calcium levels. So they do exactly opposite things. So that's why they're antagonistic hormones, right? So how does PTH increase our blood calcium levels? Well, if someone does not have enough calcium, by the way, in their blood, that condition is called hypocalcemia. And so hypocalcemia is what directly stimulates the parathyroid gland to produce parathyroid hormone. So low calcium is a direct stimulator to get PTH released, produced and released. So if someone is hypocalcemic, we need to raise their, blood, their calcium in their blood back to a normal level. So where do you get calcium from? Well, you can get it from one of two places. You can get it from your calcium store room, which are the bones in the body, or you can acquire it from the food you eat. That's it. Our body cannot make a single mineral. You get all the minerals from your diet. So the first thing that's going to happen is parathyroid hormone is going to try and tap into the storeroom. So to tap into the storeroom, we have to use the cells you learned in AMP1, osteoclast. Parathyroid hormone turns on osteoclasts, which degrade bony matrix and releases the calcium into the blood. So when these cells are degrading the bony matrix, which is, you remember, is mainly calcium phosphate salt, right? So you're dumping out a lot of calcium, but also a lot of phosphate. That's called bone resorption. That's what that, that's what that is. Osteoclasts cause bone resorption. That does not say reabsorption. Look at the word. It says resorption. So bone resorption is where you're breaking down the calcified matrix of bone and you're putting the calcium in the blood. <clears throat> so that's going to increase calcium levels in the blood directly. You can see that. But also, if you don't have enough calcium in your blood, the last thing you want your kidneys to do is to excrete calcium out in urine. 
You don't want to lose any more of it in urine, right? So parathyroid hormone also targets the kidney and causes the kidney to decrease urinary loss of calcium. So we don't urinate any more out. Parathyroid hormone also targets the kidney and tells the kidney to produce the most active form of vitamin D, calcitriol. So everybody remembers a little bit about vitamin D, right? From AMP1. You go out into the sun, the UV light hits your skin. Your skin starts to produce vitamin D for you. You can also get vitamin D in, your, in the foods that you, in, and drinks you consume. In your milk, vitamin D fortified orange juice now, all kinds of things, right? Well, vitamin D is a class of molecules in our body. It's not just one. So I'll just go through this briefly. If you go out into the sun and you absorb some UV radiation, your skin produces an immature precursor molecule of vitamin D. That precursor molecule goes to the liver, it's chemically modified into another precursor, and that precursor goes to the kidney. Now, if parathyroid hormone is present, the kidney converts that last precursor into what we call calcitriol. This is the most active form of vitamin D, and so what it does it goes to your gastrointestinal tract, the small intestines, basically, and tells the intestinal cells to maximally absorb calcium from the food you eat. This is one of the roles of the most active form of vitamin D. Not the only role, but one of the most uh, one of the roles of calcitriol. In the absence of calcitriol you still absorb a little bit of calcium from the food you eat, but not a maximal amount. You're gonna lose some when you go to the bathroom. So in the presence of calcitriol, we absorb the calcium from our food into the blood, which increases your blood calcium levels. So in these ways, parathyroid hormone increases your blood calcium levels. And obviously, since we have two hormones that either increase calcium or decrease calcium, our calcium levels in the blood have to be a pretty important controlled condition, right? And it is. We, if, you're, if you have a low calcium load in the blood, which is called hypocalcemia, or you have a high calcium load in the blood, which is called hypercalcemia, both of those events are bad. Both of those types of events, you got too much or too little, affects your nervous system, your heart, and the muscles in the body. So we don't want to mess up our calcium level in our blood. We want to maintain it within our normal ranges, right? So we have hormones that help do that. All right, so let's move on to the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland are called the suprarenal glands. That's why I put that there, because they lie on top of the kidney. This is a model of the kidney. The adrenal gland lies right on top of the kidney, just the top, the superior portion of the kidney. So if we look at the adrenal gland a little bit closer, we can see that the adrenal gland is surrounded by a, a connective tissue capsule, basically some collagen fibers there. And just deep to the capsule is this area, which is called the adrenal cortex. Now deep to that in the middle of the gland is called the adrenal medulla. So let's go through the cortex first and then get into the medulla. So if we take a section of the gland and we look at it, it looks like this. Now, the outer part of the gland, always towards the perimeter of the gland, by the way, is always the cortex. So if, if you have to identify the difference between the cortex and the medulla, it's pretty simple even if you don't even know what you're looking at. If you know the cortex is closer to the outside of the gland and the medulla is deeper in the gland, if there's a pointer somewhere in here that's pointing right here, you know you have to say adrenal cortex. If it's way in the middle, you know you have to say adrenal medulla, right? The other thing is this. The coloration, no matter what the, staining, the stains are that they use, one area is going to be darker or lighter than the other one. And typically, the one in the middle is a little bit lighter, kind of looks kind of purpley, light purple. The outer is darker. 
in most of the stains that I've seen. I have seen it opposite, but nonetheless, whenever you see a, a change in coloration, you know you're looking at a different part of the gland, by the way. So if we look at it on a higher power, so I increased the magnification right here when I did it, and I only got that little bitty part of the gland, the, the medulla, just that little part, which is just this little piece right here, all right? So this little area where I drew a circle is exactly where I focused down to in, increase the size, the magnification. So over here towards the middle is the medulla, and then this is the cortex, all right? Now, you're gonna have to know that there are three zones of cells in the cortex. So I'm gonna describe this to you. There is zone one, two, and three. It's always called zone of something, glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis. So how do you know how to identify these things? Well, it's this simple. Let's say that there is a pointer pointing to this part of the gland right there, right? I wish I could draw on this, I can't. So let's say there's a pointer right here, the pointer's right there. The outermost zone of the cortex is zone one, which is the zona glomerulosa. The zona glomerulosa is just deep to the capsule. So if it's more towards the outer part of the cortex, it has to be the glomerulosal zone. But what if it's in the direct middle? What if it's in the middle of this cortex right here, the pointer? Well, that's going to be zone two because it goes zone one, two, and three. So zone two in the middle is the zone of fasciculata. And then if the pointer is closer to the middle of the gland, but still in the cortex, like right here somewhere, you know you're, you have to identify zone three. Zone three is a zone of reticularis. That zone is closer to the middle of the gland. But look over here. Let's say I had to identify the zones here. The zones go in order all the way around the cortex. However, the outer part of the gland is now to the left. It's not to the right, if I'm looking at this part of the gland. So if there was a pointer right here, that's the zone of glomerulosa. If there was a pointer right in the middle, that's the zone of fasciculata. And if there was a pointer closer to the middle of the gland, over here, that's the zone of reticularis. Now, on good slides, you can actually see the difference between the zones. You can see it a little bit on this low magnification. The, the zona fasciculata, the cells look like they stack up like stacks of coins, by the way. So that's kind of what you see, almost like these little stripes in here. This is the zona fasciculata right there. So above it, towards the outside, would be the glomerulosa, and below it, towards the middle, would be the reticularis, right? The glomerulosal zone is the thinnest of the zones. It's only this thin, by the way, right here. From here to here is the fasciculata layer. You can kind of almost see those little stripes in there. But then this area right here is the zona reticularis. And then over here where it's a different color, that's the medulla. So that's how you identify it. Now, you all, you're going to have to know what these, the cells in these zones make. So what types of hormones do, do the glomerulosal cells make? What type does the fasciculata cells make? So forth and so on. And before I go over them, I want to tell you that the adrenal cortex only produces steroid hormones. It produces over 25 different steroid hormones. However, there are only a few that are the most concentrated. So we have a lot more steroid hormones in our body than just testosterone and estrogens, male and female hormones that we already know about. All hormones from the cortex are steroids. So let's go over them. The zona glomerulosa, the outermost layer of the cortex, produces groups of hormones called generically mineralocorticoids. 
That's a generic name for all the hormones from this zone. Mineralo means mineral. Cortic means cortex. And oid on the end means steroid. So mineralocorticoids are steroid hormones from the adrenal cortex that has something to do with minerals. Um, the most prevalent of the mineralocorticoids are ald is aldosterone. About 95% of the mineralocorticoids is aldosterone. And so that's why we always teach aldosterone. So aldosterone is a hormone that tells the kidney to save salt water. Technically, it saves salt, but then by saving salt, the kidneys reabsorb more water. So indirectly, aldosterone makes the kidneys reabsorb water as well. It doesn't do it directly though, but it does. So aldosterone is gonna be important when we're dehydrated then, just like antidiuretic hormone. If you're dehydrated, you don't want your kidneys dumping your water out, do you? You're gonna get more dehydrated. So we have several hormones that work together when we become dehydrated to help us conserve water in our body. And aldosterone is one of them. So aldosterone targets the kidney, makes the kidney save salt water, puts, the, puts that uh, salt water back into the blood. And what I mean by salt water is basically it's making the kidneys reabsorb sodium and chloride. It makes the kidney also dump out potassium in urine. So we save our sodium, which means we save our water and we decrease how much water we lose in urine. So aldosterone decreases urinary output volume, but increases blood volume. And if you increase your blood volume, you increase blood pressure. These two things always go hand in hand. So what causes aldosterone to be released from the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex? Well, two things. A hormone called angiotensin II, which is a hormone that has five principal effects in our body, and all of its effects increases our blood volume and blood pressure. And so people that have hypertension, they'll get put on sometimes an ACE inhibitor. You mean, I, I mentioned that earlier, right? ACE inhibitors block angiotensin II production. So if you have high blood pressure, you don't want this molecule, right? But at any rate, one of angiotensin II's roles is to bind to receptors on the glomeruloso cell and tell the glomeruloso cell to produce and release aldosterone. The only time we get angiotensin II produced is if we have low blood pressure and low blood volume, meaning you're dehydrated. So if you don't have enough blood volume, your blood pressure is low, angiotensin II would be produced it would stimulate the glomeruloso cells to release aldosterone, which causes the kidneys to save sodium and water, which increases blood volume and blood pressure. Now, the second stimulation for the glomeruloso cells to release aldosterone is too much potassium in the blood. If you have too much potassium in your blood, that's bad, bad, bad. So our kidneys are automatically set up to get rid of potassium. It, our kidneys are automatically set up to save sodium, but, but lose potassium in urine. So ultimately, if you have too much potassium in the blood, that's called hyperkalemia. And ultimately, if it gets really high, you're going to die from a heart attack. You're going to have a major arrhythmia, uh, uh, go into cardiac arrest. Um, I'll, I'll have to teach it how that happens when we get to cardiac physiology. But nonetheless, these are the two stimulators that stimulate the glomeruloso cells to release aldosterone. Now the middle zone, the zona fasciculata, produces uh, three principal glucocorticoids. So glucocorticoids are steroid hormones from the adrenal cortex that has something to do with glucose. And so that's what they were named a long time ago. We now know that uh, the glucocorticoids manipulate not only glucose metabolism, but also lipid and protein metabolism in our body. So it, it manipulates sugar, fats, and protein metabolism, which allows uh, our cells in our body to make ATP. Basically, it mobilizes these fuel sources around the body. 
allows our cells to make ATP. So what are the hormones? Well, the most prevalent one is cortisol, but the other ones are cortisone and corticosterone. So cortisol, cortisone, and corticosterone are basically your cortical steroids. If you ever heard anybody say that, cortical steroids, they're talking about the glucocorticoids from the adrenal cortex. You may have also heard of like when an athlete, let's say they, they damage their knee. They go to the doctor, they get their knee drained, like it'll fill up with fluid. They get the knee drained. And then the doctor gives them a shot of cortisone, right? In, inside the joint. Does anybody know why they do that? All right, well, I'll tell you. The doctor will shoot cortisone in there because cortisone's an anti-inflammatory. It decreases the pain and it decreases the fluid production so the athlete can go out there and play. Now, the bad thing about that is it also blocks the healing process. So these athletes are, athletes are really doing more harm in there than, than good. Well, our body's natural anti-inflammatory are the glucocorticoids because that's their other role. They're an anti-inflammatory molecule, all right? So these basically help. These are our stress hormones. They help control the inflammatory responses. They, but if we overproduce them, that would be bad. If we underproduce them, that would be bad because both of those states induce a disease state. Um, we're going to learn those disease states in lecture. So for now, just know the hormone and a little bit about what it does in this little paragraph. All right. The next zone, the last zone of the adrenal cortex is called the zona reticularis. Those cells produce groups of hormones called androgens and androgens are a generic word for male hormone and yes males and females make androgens in their adrenal gland it's just that in males it's fairly insignificant at least in males past at puberty and on because the testicles make so much testosterone that it overrides the androgens from the adrenal cortex from the, the reticularis but in females, this is the source of the androgens in the female body. So the main androgen here is another word that students hate. Oh, I don't know. I can never spell that word. And they get upset. And it's not. But if you look at this word, dehydroepiandrosterone is, or DHEA, is spelled exactly how it's pronounced. Dehydroepi androsterone just pronounce it out and you'll be able to spell it it's spelled exactly how it's pronounced dehydroepiandrosterone or dhea is a male hormone now in a male baby growing in utero it's important because it starts to set set up the growth of the male reproductive structures and organs um even you know after the baby's born baby young childhood before puberty DHEA is the principal source of androgens in the, in the boy. But at puberty, the growth of the testicles and the external genitalia and the other reproductive structures on the inside of the body, the testicles start overproducing, producing a lot of testosterone. So there's a lot more testosterone in the body at that point than there is DHEA in the male. But what is interesting physiologically about this hormone is in females, postmenopausal females, as you know, at menopause, the female stops producing their hormones. Their ovaries stop making their hormones, right? Well, some females have postmenopausal symptoms. They suffer from them. And some females, it's, it doesn't really bother them that much at all. So what is the difference between the females that do suffer and some that don't? Well, it's the amount of these androgens that they make in their zona reticularis. Because postmenopausally, these androgens are broken down into estradiol compounds in the body. Same thing with testosterone, by the way. Testosterone and estrogen are very related steroids. So these male hormones are actually broken down into the estrogens. And I say estradiol compounds because there's six major classes of estrogen, by the way. It's not just one hormone. But nonetheless, um, these androgens become the the precursor to the, the estrogens in the female body. So where do the female hormones come from postmenopausally? From the zona reticularis. 
That's where they come from. All right, now, this last little paragraph down here talks about the hypothalamus with the hypothalamic hormones and the anterior pituitary hormones. I'm about to talk about this. So just keep reading as you're reading through the chapter and you get through there. I'm going to talk about this in just in a minute. We're almost done. I know your brains are tired. Um, but let's get through the rest of the glands first so I can tell you about the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary glands a little bit more. All right. Now, the next gland is the pancreas. The pancreas lies in the upper left quadrant of the abdominal pelvic cavity. The stomach would lie right on top of it, so it's just posterior to the stomach and just a little inferior. But ultimately, uh, the stomach would be here. It's been removed. The stomach would indent over here into the spleen. This is your spleen. And in the middle is the pancreas. Now, the pancreas is two different types of glands. It's an exocrine gland which I'm not concerned with today, and an endocrine gland, which I am concerned with today. The majority of all the cells in the pancreas, which are called acini cells, down here, acini cells, or acinus, are all of these cells over here that are darker in color everywhere. Those are all of the exocrine portion of the gland, and they produce digestive enzymes that are secreted to the small intestine via the pancreatic duct. We're going to cover that in the digestive system. What I'm interested in today are these lighter staining little circles. This is your identifying character for the pancreas, by the way. When you look at the slide, when you see these lighter staining little circles, you're looking at the pancreas. These lighter staining circles are called pancreatic islets or the islets of Langerhans. There's four cell types in these little circles, the islets. You need to know the cell name and the hormone they make, which is right here. Alpha cells produce glucagon. Glucagon increases our blood sugar. And you can read down through this little paragraph. I need you to know these bold type terms, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and lipolysis. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll just tell you what they are. How does glucagon increase your blood sugar? Well, it taps into the sugar store. So where is the sugar store in our body? In the liver. Liver. And the sugar store is in the form of a polysaccharide called glycogen. So that glycogen is just made up of a whole bunch of glucose units. So if you need glucose in the blood, why don't we go break down that big sugar into all of its individual components? And when you break down glycogen into its individual components, which is glucose, that's called glycogenolysis. So glucagon targets the liver and causes glycogenolysis to increase, which releases glucose into the blood, which raises your blood sugar. This is your blood sugar, by the way, if you didn't know that, glucose. All right, now, the other thing that pretty, which is pretty cool, the liver and a part of the kidney can do this. Your liver and at least part of the kidney can actually make a new sugar from a non-sugar. Certain precursor molecules like some amino acids and lactic acid from your muscles can be used as building blocks to make glucose. So that's pretty cool. The liver can convert other molecules into sugar, can make your own sugar. If you make a new sugar, that's called gluconeogenesis. So glucagon increases glycogenolysis. It, it increases gluconeogenesis. And it increases okay. lipolysis. Does somebody have a question? I heard somebody speaking. All right. So uh, what is lipolysis then? Well, lipolysis is the breakdown of lipids in your adipose tissue. Um, it breaks the triglycerides down into glycerol and the fatty acids, which are released into the blood. And those fatty acids can be used to make ATP aerobically in the mitochondria that everybody forgets about from uh, general biology. But nonetheless, um, that's called lipolysis. So what does glucagon really do? It mobilizes sugars in the blood and it mobilizes energy sources in the form of parts of lipids. So we can make ATP, right? Um, don't worry about positive inotropic agent yet. I'm gonna talk about that in, in lecture and, and when we get to cardiac physiology, 
Um, I'm not going to put this part on the test yet, but you could start reading through it. All right. Basically, a positive, anything that is considered to be a positive inotrope increases cardiac activity. That's the bottom line without getting into how and why and what. Right. So there are certain hormones, drugs, chemicals that can increase cardiac output. And they're called positive inotropes. And glucagon is a positive inotrope. All right, now, as far as the beta cells are concerned, they release insulin. You need to know that insulin decreases your blood sugar. So, oh, I forgot to tell you, uh, glucagon, alpha cells are gonna release glucagon when you have low blood sugar, hypo, hy hypoglycemia. And, and also a couple other stimulations like sympathetic activity and all of that. Um, just know these two, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia for now, all right? So what causes the beta cells to release insulin? High blood sugar, hyperglycemia. So the beta cells know when your blood sugar is too high and it releases insulin. So what does insulin do? Well, insulin causes the body cells to take sugar up from the blood, which obviously will start to drop your blood sugar. And some of the cells that take the sugar up from the blood are going to be the cells, lo and behold, of the liver. So if we have excess sugar in our blood that we're not going to use immediately, why don't we put it back into our storeroom in case we need it later on? Well, insulin does that. Insulin tells the liver to take the extra sugar and rebuild up glycogen. That's called glycogenesis. When you produce glycogen, it's called glycogenesis. When you break down glycogen, that's called glycogenolysis, right? Now, the other thing, and so we save our sugar in the liver. We rebuild up our sugar store. The other thing insulin is going to do, besides many of its other functions, um, is it basically tells your adipocytes to save sugar as fat. So the sugar molecules, when we overconsume sugar, carbohydrates, that we're not burning off because we're not uh, using, burning those calories. Insulin tells your adipocytes to take the sugar molecules and build triglycerides from it, which is fat. So when we're building fat molecules, triglyceride or lipids, that's called lipogenesis. All right, so we, basically insulin is a fat building hormone as well but it does some other good things. It also causes uh, protein production in the body as well. So it, insulin does a few other things more than just sugar regulation, which we're going to get more in detail in lecture than in here. So the Delta cells then just know what these cells make. We don't have to go into their roles. Delta cells produce somatostatin and F cells produce pancreatic polypeptide. I mean, you could look at what the somatostatin controls uh, alpha cells and beta cell activity. Pancreatic polypeptide is going to basically regulate in some form or fashion how the pancreas um, produces uh, enzymes for digestion. Also uh, is involved in manipulating other parts of the digestive system, like the gallbladder. You may have heard of the gallbladder, right? So it will involve in the gallbladder can release more uh, bile to the small intestine. So we're going to get into this later. That's why I said, don't worry about it now when we do the digestive system. All right. We have two glands left to cover. I know your brains are tired, but we're about to get done in a minute. All right. So if we take a section through the testicle, you're going to see a whole bunch of tubes everywhere. These are tubes, not circled. This would be tubes that would come out of the plane of the board at you. So the testicle is a whole bunch of little bitty tubules everywhere. And the tubules is what I'm not interested in right now. Because this tubule, which is called the seminiferous tubule, is where sperm cells are made. So obviously that's going to be important when we do the reproductive chapter. But what I am interested in in this chapter are the interstitial endocrinocytes right here. These are also called the interstitial cells of Leydig. That's another term you might read in your book. So the interstitial endocrinocytes are cells that lie on the outside of the seminiferous tubules everywhere. So there's some, these are interstitial 
endocrinocytes. These are endocrinocytes. Those are, so all the cells that lie on the outside of the seminiferous tubules are the cells that make testosterone. And you have to know that. What cell type produces testosterone? Oh, the interstitial endocrinocytes or the interstitial cells of Leydig, right? So um, the testicles produce, obviously, testosterone. They also produce a hormone called inhibin, um, which I'm not too concerned with at the moment. But let's just know a little bit about testosterone. I already mentioned earlier that Together, testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone increase sperm production, which is called spermatogenesis. Um, but testosterone is also, you might already know, is the hormone that causes the differences between the male and female body plan, partly during development and partly at puberty. So obviously, testosterone and the other, uh, like DHEA, is going to cause a male pattern of development. It's going to cause an enlargement of the male sexual organs at puberty. Um, it's going to bring about the sexual, the secondary sexual characteristics at puberty that are the differences between males and females. Like males have deeper voices. They have a denser bone density. They have a denser mu muscle mass. They have differences in fat distribution patterns around the body than, than females do. And there's differences in hair distribution patterns around, around the body. Males have, uh, you know, coarser facial hair, which we call a beard, you know. These are things that we already know because everybody's gone through puberty already. So uh, testosterone also is the hormone that drives libido in males and females, by the way. Estrogen does not drive libido in a female. It's DHEA in, from the adrenal gland, the male hormone. Um, so just know a few of these things that are in here. Some of those are self-explanatory because we already know about them. The last gland that we're going to cover is the ovary. So this is a model of the ovary. I'm not going to go over exactly what all of these different little things are in here, but I will say, because we're going to do that in a reproductive chapter. But what I will say is all of these little things in here all come from this one little circle. These are different developmental stages of these little follicles. And so that's where eggs are, the, the egg cells are going to be made. So depending on what part of the female reproductive cycle the female is in, the hormones come from a different structure in the ovary. Before ovulation, they come from all the follicles. After ovulation, it comes from this little structure over here called the corpus luteum, which I did put in the paragraph right here. All right. But we're going to cover more of that when uh, we get to the reproductive chapter. So for now, I want you to know the hormones that the ovaries make. Everybody knows the estrogens and the progesterone, but it also makes relaxin and inhibin. So inhibin is a hormone that controls the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from the, from the anterior pituitary gland. Relaxin becomes important like at, when a pregnant female, when they're, when they're about to give birth to the baby, it causes a relaxation of the pubic symphysis joint that you learned about in AMP1, which allows for the baby's head to come down through the birth canal. So nonetheless, obviously just be able to list out these hormones for me, all right? Now, this section in the book contains organs in the body that are not considered to be glands. Obviously, we don't think the heart is a gland or the kidney being a gland. But these organs in the body make hormones in their own right. So um, you can read through this. We're going to cover these hormones more as we get into other chapters. So you can start learning it now. But for instance, we're going to talk about atrial natriuretic peptide, angiotensin II and how it's made, um, and aldosterone in the cardiac chapter. We're going to talk about them again when we get to the urinary chapter. We're going to talk about erythropoietin or EPO from the kidneys when we do the blood chapter. So we're going to talk about some of these hormones later on. Some of them we're not going to cover specifically, but I did put a little conversation about some of them in here. We will talk about cholecystokinin though in a digestive system. Um, 
But it's pretty interesting. The liver makes a hormone. Your bones make a hormone. Your adipose tissue makes a hormone. So you might read through that just to get an idea of all these other organs and tissues in the body that are making hormones for us. Now, the last two things in the chapter that you need to look at deal with the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland. So other, somebody earlier was saying, well, how do I know what those hormones are going to do, right? So ultimately, the hypothalamus, which is the bottom of the thalamus on the brain, and the anterior pituitary gland are considered to be the master glands in the body. The hypothalamus produces hormones that control the anterior pituitary gland cells. The anterior pituitary gland cells produce hormones that control all of the other glands and tissues in the body. So the hypothalamus has to produce a hormone first before the anterior pituitary gland can produce its hormone. So let me show you what types of hormones the hypothalamus makes generically. The hypothalamus makes basically two types of hormones. They make either a releasing hormone or an inhibiting hormone. So the hypothalamic, you'll, you'll always know a hypothalamic hormone because it'll either have releasing in the name or inhibiting in the name. So for instance, corticotropin releasing hormone which is abbreviated CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, controls the corticotrophs in the anterior pituitary gland. That's why it has cortico in the name. And a tropin basically affects another gland. So the corticotropin releasing hormones, since it's a releasing hormone, tells the corticotrophs, <clears throat> excuse me, to release their hormones. So the corticotrophs in the anterior pituitary gland cannot release their hormones unless the hypothalamus tells them to do it first. So this is the flow chart of control. The hypothalamus has to release corticotropin releasing hormone, which then circulates down to the anterior pituitary gland and tells the corticotrophs Basically, it binds to receptors on the corticotrophs, which tells the corticotrophs to produce uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, and melanocyte-stimulating hormone, MSH, right? Thyrotropin-releasing hormone controls the thyrotrophs. And since it's a releasing hormone, it tells the thyrotrophs to produce thyroid-stimulating hormone, which somebody said earlier, Thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the thyroid gland. And it does because it does exactly what the name implies. So before the thyroid gland could ever make its hormone, ever, at least T3 and T4, before the thyroid gland can ever make T3 and T4, the hypothalamus has to release thyrotropin releasing hormone first, which tells the thyrotrophs to release Thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone gets into the blood, which circulates down to the thyroid gland and tells the thyroid follicular cells to make T3 and T4. That's a flow chart of communication. Hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland produces a hormone that goes to the next gland. That's how this works. Now, Gonadotropin releasing hormone <clears throat> is going to control the gonadotrophs. And since it's the releasing hormone, which is GnRH, it tells the gonadotrophs to produce follicle stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH, which then targets the gonads and tells the gonads to do whatever it is they need to tell them to do. We're going to cover the roles of these hormones specifically in the reproductive chapter, okay? But I'll just give you a generic. Follicle-stimulating hormone causes sperm production in male, causes egg 
production in the female. Luteinizing hormone has a couple of more roles in a female, but in the male, it, this is what causes the interstitial endocrinocytes to make testosterone, is luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone also in the female tells the ovaries to make estrogens and progesterones, but it also is the hormone that brings about ovulation. So I need to tell you how that works later on. But we also have uh, the rest of these releasing and inhibiting hormones. I'm going to let you go through them. Growth hormone releasing hormone, GHIRH, causes the somatotrophs to make human growth hormone. The inhibiting hormone blocks the somatotrophs from making their hormone. Same thing with prolactin. And somebody showed me this yesterday. Look, I forgot to put prolactin down here. I just wrote inhibit secretion of, but there's nothing here. I never, ever noticed that before. So ultimately, prolactin releasing hormone causes the lactotrophs to release prolactin. The inhibiting hormone prevents lactotrophs from releasing prolactin, which is abbreviated PRL. So you can write that in right there, prolactin. I have the book and it does have it in there. Okay, so if you have the book, I might have, when I was updating this thing, I might have just deleted it some kind of way. But I'm glad you said that because I forgot to say this. Before I tell you the very last thing and we're done, I need to go back up here. If anybody has the paper book, the old, like when we used to be able to get it. Yeah, are you talking about the... Um, Cal calcitonin? Calcitonin, yeah, that was going to be my question. Yeah, it's wrong in the paper book. I ultimately caught it and fixed it wherever I have it. Now I forgot where I put it. Where, where's the, the thyroid gland? Here it is. All right, so in the paper book, if you're using the hard copy of the book, the one I, we used to use a long time ago, this says evidently calcitonin uh, CT, uh, and it shouldn't really say which. This is just bad all over. It should say calcitonin functions to decrease blood calcium levels. I shouldn't even have which in there. Calcitonin, which functions, doesn't even sound good, right? Oh, well, no, no it starts up it here. says It says um, which functions to increase blood yeah, so calcium if you, level. That's what I'm saying. If you have the paper book, you need to change the word right here that says increase to decrease because this is correct. Calcitonin decreases blood calcium levels. It does not increase it. I just, I just was, you know, I actually wrote this chapter at like one in the morning, something like that. So I messed up in a couple of places. So there's a couple of mistakes in that paper book before, and I, I was reworking on this to make a fourth edition and we stopped using it. So all I did was fix some of the mistakes in the PDFs. All right. So calcitonin does not increase blood calcium levels it decreases blood calcium levels. The hormone that increases blood calcium levels is parathyroid hormone, increases blood calcium levels. All right, now that that's fixed, let's look at the last table. So somebody was asking- Can I ask you a question about um, this table you just mentioned, the corticotropin releasing hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone, and gonadotropin tropin release hormone. Okay, what um, about it? Is there any, um, how the secretions of ACTH and uh, MS and all those um, hormones, how are they going to be inhibited if it's not in the table? So, so some, of, some of the hypothalamic hormones, well, some of the controls are not controlled with inhibiting hormones. Right. Now, there is an inhibiting hormone for that one, but I didn't put it. Okay. All right. But so not you from the you, hypothalamus, right? That from the, all of these come from the hypothalamus. No, I know, I know. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not clear in my, in my question. I see that um, the hypothalamus have, has some inhibiting hormone for the somatic, somatotrophs and lactotrophs, but I don't see any inhibiting hormones for corticotrophs. Or Correct. So that's what I'm saying is there are a couple of more inhibiting hormones, like one for corticotropin releasing hormone, that's mainly right. controlled by the level of the hormone in the blood from the, from the gland itself. 
But oh, okay. my thing is this, I put in here the ones I want you to learn for the test, okay? So okay. you don't have to worry about it if there's inhibiting for this one or that one. Don't, don't, don't put more work on yourself. Okay, right? I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, so just to let you know, some of these do have inhibiting hormones that they have recently, well, in the past 10 years have discovered. But um, there's more releasing hormones than inhibiting hormones from the hypothalamus. I'll put it to you that way. And so just know these inhibiting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, now, um, the table down here covers the cell type from the anterior pituitary gland with the, the hormone that they're making that we just covered up here. And I just wrote a little synopsis, not every single thing, but just a little bit about what the targets are and what the responses are for the anterior pituitary gland hormones. So learn at least what is in here for their, for their roles in the body, all right? So obviously we already did this one, stimulates follicular cells to make T3, T4, okay? All right, and so if you have a problem with just learning these statements that's in here for their roles, just let me know and I'll help you out with it. All right, so that is it from this chapter. Before I stop sharing this screen, does anybody have a particular question about something that I covered in here? I have a question real quick. Um, okay. I know you said this one doesn't have a Quizlet. So all of those little slides you showed us, that were like the, you know, the enhanced slides, those are gonna be on the um, practical, right? Yeah, all of that information is in the learning resources in, in the class, so let me go back there. Well, I just wanna make sure like I'm looking yeah. at the right slides. No, you, you, yeah, all of the slide, everything that's on the practical is in this module. Okay. Every picture that you're gonna see on a practical examination, is going to be somewhere in one of these resources in all of your modules. Now, I will say this though, for the heart one next week, I noticed yesterday there's no sheep, uh, sheep heart dissection. And there's going to be a sheep heart uh, that is dissected on the test. So I'm gonna have to go find a resource for that and include it in here. So I'm gonna try and do that before next week. All right, but I, I know the sheep part is not in here yet. Um, but everything else is going to be in here. Your learning resources, model videos, Quizlets, everything. All right. And I'll just say this. If for some reason, because a whole bunch of different faculty members got together and wrote a whole bunch of questions, compile them all together. So the, the practicals come from a pool of questions. If for some reason there's ever a picture on the practical that we can't find in this learning module, I'm going to, I'm going to curb it because I did notice there wasn't a picture for one of them. I think it's been fixed already. Uh, on the third practical, it was like a picture of a model of a testes that wasn't in the learning module. So I threw it out. So if there's something like that and I'll grade them all by hand anyway, if there's something like that, I'm going to curb it back. All right, so um, let me stop sharing my screen.